Okay. So um, today I'm going to speak about managing a data science team and the lessons learned. Uh, before we start, this is the agenda. It's a little bit packed, all right? Um, basically, I will introduce myself and I will introduce Typhoon, the current company that I'm working for. Then I will explain a little bit what it takes to build a strong data science team, um, some effective communication strategies that it might seem like a minor thing, but it's quite important actually. Um, balancing technical and business needs, that's like juggling all the time. Um, the team, team dynamics, how to effectively define a project scope and the timeline uh, of the project, and how important it is to foster innovation and creativity. And finally, I will do some summary. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm a physicist. I did a PT in physical oceanography, which might seem not related to data at all, I know. Um, but basically, during my PT, what I did was creating models, data models, to explain how the ocean, how the climate behaves. Um, and then I realized that what I really liked is to get information from data, uh, understand and answer questions using data. And also, I like to eat. And the academy and eating, it's not quite com com compatible at some point in life. So I decided to move into a private sector um, to actually use data models to answer more specific questions to the, to the business and basically have an impact. Um, one of the things that I was feeling when I was in the academy was, who cares? Who cares actually what I'm doing? I, I have like no real impact anywhere. Um, and I find it really rewarding to do something that it's really meaningful to someone. Um, fun fact, I love photography and I'm a very proud geek, so happy to talk about Star Wars if you, you are. Um, my experience, so I started back in 2016 in IRECAD, the Technological Research Facility of Catalonia. Uh, I spent two and a half years there as a researcher and data scientist, basically um, with Marc Adurs there, actually. Um, we were doing projects about mobility, IoT. So one of the biggest projects that I did back in the day was to analyze the data that came from mobile phones to actually define the movement of people around, around Barcelona. Um, so it was quite a big data project, actually. Then I moved into Mango, where I met Jerome, um, and I spent one and a half years being the lead scientist of, of the team, of the analytics, um, advanced analytics team. Um, my main project was the optimization of prices during clearance sales. It was a big um, challenge because we didn't have any big data infrastructure at the time. So we had to not only create the model and so on, but also all the infrastructure needed, uh, how the data was consumed by the different uh, PMs at the time and so on. So it was like an end-to-end -end project. Um, then I moved into Codify, which I spent a year being the data and insight scientist. There was a team that was mainly BI. There was nothing um, done in terms of data science. So my main challenge was to actually start the data science team. Basically, we started doing some uh, chart and chart trust predictions, some models, but basically it was ETL. So it was back back into, <laughs> into the beginnings. Um, and then um, almost two years ago, I moved into Typhoon. My first half of this period was basically being a hands-on data scientist there. Um, we, the main project was to create a model that was able to recommend to, so it was a model that was recommending the best ne next action to our customers. For instance, uh, do an integration or um, improve your, um, your plan or move into another set of features that you might like. And this information was used by our customer support agents when where we were talking live to our customers to recommend something directly and improve the retention, which actually improved the retention like around three, four percent, so which was quite relevant actually. Um, and then almost a year ago, I was promoted into manager of the data science production team. So it was a team meant to be like the machine learning team. So basically based on the infrastructure part, well, you know how these things go. 
layoffs happen, a lot of changes happen, very fast-paced company. So basically, I'm now managing the whole data science pillar at Typhoon, which is formed by machine learning engineers and data scientists as well. Um, I'm going to introduce Typhoon real quick. I'm pretty sure you all know the company. Um, basically, what we do is to help businesses get the data that they need um, with forms, but in a way that people actually enjoy um, answering those, those forms. So the goal is simple, is to inspire people so you get more retention, you get more conversion, you get more information from your customers. Um, our product, um, we've changed quite recently, actually less than a month ago, um, the whole brand of the, of the company. So now if you go to typhoon.com, you will find like new branding, new information, but the core business is the same. We're trying to collect, to, we enable people to collect data from their customers in the most powerful and possible way. I'm going to start with a couple of statements. So data science is not a magic word. When you talk to the business, they believe like literally you get a hat, you take a rabbit out of it and boom, magic, you create something. That's definitely not it. Um, and it's quite difficult to make them understand that you cannot predict anything. It's like, it's not magic. Um, and the second statement is that we are not unicorns. Um, we can't possibly know everything. Companies expect data scientists to know about um, engineering, to know about business, to know about modeling, about everything. That's not even possible. There's like literally you cannot know anything. Um, that's where the imposter syndrome comes in, right? We all have that moment where, oh my God, I cannot compete with people that know so much. No one knows everything. Let me tell you that. Just focus on what you do best, focus on your strength, know your weaknesses as well. But everybody has something that it's good at something that it's not that good at. Um, what is data science then? So data science has revolutionized problem solving um, by extracting valuable insights from vast amounts of data, driving innovation and transforming businesses. We are professional problem solvers. That's what we are. We are able to actually get data, um, create something from it, out of it, and create business value. And our main focus should be that business value. That's what the focus should be. So how? How do we build a, data, a strong data science team? How do we put all the blocks together? What do we need? What's the secret recipe? There's none, let me tell you. But first of all, you need to focus on hiring the right people. We need, of course, technical skills. We need people that is able to code. We need people that is able to understand infrastructure, that is able to create a neural network if you need it. But that's not it. That's not all. Data science is a lot more than that. We need people that has curiosity, people that has creativity, and we need people that collaborate together. It might seem silly, but when you think about it, data scientists is not people that enjoy simply being like coding all the time. They need to interact with the business. They need to talk to people. They need to present results. They need to gather up insights from the business. And that's a conversation and you need soft skills to do that. You can have the most amazing programmer in the entire world, but probably it's not meant to be a data scientist. Probably it's meant to be, I don't know, an uh, infrastructure guy or girl or you know something like that. But data science, it's about collaboration. So it's super important that you focus on these soft skills. Once you've got your team, you need to create a culture. And sometimes we underestimate the power of it. We need to create a culture that values continuous learning and growth. We get tired super easily. We get demotivated. We are curious. We are like, we need something interesting to do. If you start doing things that are boring, people are going to quit. That's for sure. Two months. That's the maximum amount. We received like, I don't know, hundreds, maybe hundreds, no, but dozens of LinkedIn offers every single day. You need to retain your team. You need to keep them entertained, not entertained, sorry, but motivated. You need to give them something that really is a challenge, challenge enough so they can overcome it. 
And to do so, um, it's super important to have a program of training and development. It's super important to create in-house some knowledge sharing platform. For instance, doing internal meetups, participating in activities inside the whole company. We have something called Hive Sprints, where once a quarter, people from any department get together and create something, something that might not even get into production, but it's something fun, something interesting that might get a lot of value out of it. It's like a small hackathon, internal hackathon, but something that's a real challenge and motivates people to keep going. And you need to foster a supportive environment. You need to allow people to ask questions, to challenge you, and you need to ask for feedback and give feedback in return. Every two weeks, I have a retrospective, and every single time I got challenged, why are we doing this? Is it the right thing? Is it the right way to do it? Why is this project important? Who asked that? I encourage the team to ask those questions because they are part of the team. I cannot go to the team and say, look, we've got this request, you need to do it. They need to understand why. Why is it important? Where is the value? Where they can participate in adding value to it. So they are part of the decision. They are part of the process. Communication strategies. How do you create this environment um, and also how important it is to have a clear and consistent communication. You need to talk to stakeholders. Your stakeholders are your clients. We, normally, in most companies, um, at least in my experience, we are like an internal consultancy firm, right? We have customers and our customers are different business units. They come to a problem, which normally they don't come to you with a problem. Normally it's you asking, what is your problem? What is your challenge? And then coming up with something that may solve that problem, right? Um, and when you found the problem, you identify the problem, you iterate, you find the solution and so on, but you need to communicate that. I know it, it, it can be tricky, but in the end, it's all about making sure that people understand what you're doing, because otherwise it's very difficult to prove the value to the company. So one thing that I found that it's extremely useful is to use the grammar principle. When speaking with anyone, let's, for instance, I don't know, product, right? You got your stakeholder, it's product, and you need to create an amazing EA feature. Don't start explaining um, what a neural network is, what an LLM is, how amazing your gazillion of parameters have made this LLM the most amazing in the world. They don't give a crap, let me tell you. You need to make them understand what this is about. The grammar principle says, if you can explain anything to your grandma and she understand it, understands it, understands it, then use those words to explain it to the business. Use this exact, exact same words. Don't expect the business to understand all the technical details out of it because they are not. They are not gonna. It's, it's, they have like a million different problems in, in, in their plate. They cannot spend time understanding what it is. So make it simple and make it understandable. Also, one of the things that I found regarding that is we tend to focus on parameters, right? Accuracy, F1 score, blah, blah. Sometimes it's not as important if you gain like 2% extra accuracy. Maybe it's better that you choose a model that it's actually understandable. Like you can explain why the features are acting like that, how they contribute. If you are able to explain that to the business, you got the buy-in. Then that project is going to be successful for sure. And you also need to tailor your communication style to the needs of each team member. It's completely different to talk to an engineer, a machine learning engineer, than a data scientist or a data analyst. You need to be really aware of speaking the same language because otherwise it's very complicated that you get alignment and you need that alignment within your team and with other teams as well. This is probably one of the, I think this slide can seem like the most, not important, like, like the, a silly one, but it's in my opinion, the most important one. So you need to build trust. 
you need to build transparency within your team. You are the reference for your team. They need to believe in you. And how to do that is be really open and being transparent and honest about the project goals, the timelines, and the challenges. You need to explain to your team, look, we need to do this, and we need this amount of time to do it. And timelines can change. It's fine. But they need to have this sort of scope so they can organize themselves. Otherwise, you will be micromanaging. And that's not something that the team will really appreciate. Um, involving team members in decision-making processes, that's super difficult to do. Because we tend to simply, you know, came a project, we need to solve it, come on, so on. But they need to be involved. They need to understand why that project is important. They need to participate so they make them their own. The team is the one that is going to do the work. So they need to believe in that work. They need to believe that that project in that particular way is the best possible way to do it. And the only way to do so is to get the feedback from the team, to involve in the decision making. Also, that's why it's so important to have a diverse team. Difference in background, difference in age, difference in gender. Everybody brings something different to the table. A single project, while you are looking at it from the same angle, you will only get the same input. But if you look at the problem from different angles, you will get a solution that will probably be way better than the other one. And this doesn't mean creating chaos. I'm, I'm not sure about your business, but mine's quite crazy. They change decisions this fast, and sometimes it's a bit chaotic, and sometimes you start doing a project. Data science project might take like three, four, five months to complete. In that time, priorities have changed completely. Um, if you are completely transparent to the team, and don't get me wrong, I, I very much like, like it to do so, but you're only creating chaos. You need to make sure that whatever information you are passing into the team is the relevant one. And it's okay to say, I don't know that. And I have no idea, bear with me. But try not to create chaos passing all the information into the team. The team needs to be focused on working. All the different directions that the business is taking, all the different realities that are happening on different teams, that's your job to manage as a manager. The team should not be affected by that. They should have that trust in you that you will be the umbrella. You are the umbrella of the team. You need to protect the team from the chaos. Um, but at the same time, you need to be open with the team and you need to make sure that they trust you completely, that you are not hiding information that is relevant for them. So this is the jungling part. How do you balance the technical and the business needs? I found out that the best way to make sure that the technical part and the business parts are equal is to keep in mind what your end user is going to be. Keep that in mind as a, as a North Star. You need to create something for that particular business unit, for that particular person. So you need to understand what the business context is and you need a way to measure the impact. If you don't measure the impact, it's like it hasn't existed. You need to prove to the business, look, this is what we're doing. This is how much impact we're having. This is because otherwise, what I found otherwise is that somehow the, the power of the team, or not the power, but the, the the rest of the business do not believe in your team. So it gets on the side. So one thing that has happened actually to us at Typhoon is that because of several reasons, but some of the teams in data science before were working on things that they considered they were, it were amazing. Well, amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, super relevant, super important, um, trending topic but then there was no, no business need for it. So the business get tired of, oh, they're doing their thing, but not really making any impact because they are not solving a real problem. So you need to balance those two. You need to balance solving business problems. Sometimes it's with a regression, let me tell you, um, with 
okay, how can we make this project stand out? How can we create an infrastructure that is top notch? How can we learn something? We want to learn in the end. Being so working at a company is an investment, an investment of your time and an investment of your knowledge. And you get something in return. You get money in return and you get experience. So you need to balance those two. Setting the clear standards is so important. One of the things that I like when I start a project with any business unit is, look, this is how we work. This is how it's going to be. We're going to have iterations. We're going to be in touch using this channel, this other channel, um, this email, whatever. Um, and we're going to do that. This is a timeline that we're talking about. Just set the standard that you want to work and explain it to anyone involved in the, in the project. And be clear about the expectations. What kind of expectations do you have for your team? Do you have expectations of having poor core quality? Like, do you want to make it fast, whatever it takes? Uh, do you expect the team to spend hours documenting or not? What is your expectation? Just make it clear. Make clear whatever it is that you're expecting to. Um, and also in testing. Do you expect test in the, in the code or not? Or what do you want? Simply make it clear to the team. Whatever it is, whatever works for you, make sure that you communicate that to the wider team. Team dynamics. Every single team has their own dynamics, let me tell you. Um, in my experience, I have, I have used mostly all of, all of, all of them, uh, from Kanban to um, Agile, doing daily stand-ups, doing weekly stand-ups, project-based stand-ups. It really, really depends on the team. Make sure that you find whatever works for you. In my particular case right now, we have one hour a week where we present to the whole team the project status. We go through the Jira board, this project, we are doing this. Um, this has been done the past week, and this is going to be the work that we're doing this week. That's enough. They don't need daily stand-ups, if they don't want it, don't push the team to have a dynamics that doesn't work for them. But make sure that you understand what they need before taking any decision into it. Um, it's so important to foster this sense of psychological safety within the team. You need to create a space when people can speak up. Um, make people feel comfortable sharing idea, taking risks. You are the umbrella, right? So you are there to protect the team, but you need to make the team available uh, 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 to enable the team to actually take a risk. Okay, look, this might not work. You want to try it? Let's go for it. I will back you up. They need that, that <coughs> safety, that safe net over there to take risk and innovate. Maybe it, go, it can go wrong, but it can, get, it can go amazing, right? Um, and also, and making mistakes. We all make mistakes. It's fine. There's no problem with that. Um, the, at least what I like to do is the wins of the team are their own. So they own their own wins. If there is a mistake, if there's a failure, that's on me. That's what I own. I own the mistakes of my team. But I make sure that if they have a win, it's completely theirs. I don't enter there. And I also like this idea of positive feedback. We give it as soon as it happens and in a public way. Constructive feedback, we give it as soon as it happens in a personal way. And they are able to do so with me as well. I, I do mistakes and I want them to be able to say, Carmen, I think you messed up there. And it's fine. We are all learning. So they we are a team. We need to create that strong be belonging to something. Um, each person is completely different. Um, just be really aware of the individual strengths and weaknesses that your team has. Um, in my case, for instance, I have found some people in my team that they, they like to work alone. They, they don't like to interact with people. And that's completely fine, but make sure that you understand that so you don't give them a project that they have to interact with 13 different stakeholders. 
to make them aware and comfortable owning their own strengths and weaknesses. Um, this creates a cohesive and an effective team. Um, and it's very important that you align the talents of your team with the needs of the project. So just make sure that you either align always or you give that person the opportunity to change, to, to improve something. Maybe they don't want to improve, and that's completely fine. But if they want to, make sure that they have a, a project that can make them stand out on that, on that direction. Um, how do you manage the project scope and the timeline? It's so important to balance competitive priorities and constraints. You need to prioritize. Um, normally, I got like, I don't know, 20 requests a quarter. We are four people. So you make the math, it's impossible to actually do so. So how do you actually make sure that you are prioritizing the most impactful work? Just focus on what is the impact that we're making? What is a project that can make a real impact in the company? And focus on that. And then if you have um, worked in consultancy, um, at least in my experience, works, this works quite, quite well, and it's doing iterations, at least three iterations to define the scope, to define what the priorities are, and then involve the stakeholders on that part. Don't just write down whatever they need, go to your cave for two months and then come up like, hey, look, I've created this amazing thing. It's probably gonna be completely different than what they were expecting or completely different what they wanted. So make them um, part of the decision. Show prototypes, show uh, ideas, involve the client in this case, or whatever business stakeholders you have in that decision. Um, break down any big project into smaller pieces. Um, normally it's quite well defined, right? First you do, um, an exploration of the data, then you come up with an idea, you test out the idea in a prototype. If it's validated, then you go put it in production and then you need to monitor it and so on. So you can like break down a project in different stages, make sure you do that and communicate that to the business and what the clear timeline is for each of the parts. Um, and make sure that each part it's aligned with the business goals. Because there might be some parts that they are not, and you need to push for it. No one cares about monitoring in the business, let me tell you. But that's so important to have. You need to push back. You need to say, look, I know you want the project to be finished, but I'm not going to finish it till I've got the monitoring in place, and so on. Um, be proactive about identifying and mitigating risk. Um, I've seen so many times when a project starts, you define the scope, you define the timeline, you define what is the goal, blah, blah, blah. Um, but you don't put any risk. You need to write down the risk there um, so people is aware. It's all right to have problems. It's all right to have uh, challenges. But you need to make sure that you communicate that in a clear way. Um, this, this means that you're anticipating potential roadblocks. Which dependencies do you have with other teams? If so, don't tell them one week, like next week I'm gonna need this pipeline to be there. No, just tell them with enough time so they can be prepared. They got their own um, workload. They, own, they, they have their own um, like sprint. So make sure that you communicate everything. Um, develop also contingency plans. What will happen if that pipeline will break? Is there a backup? Uh, is there a way to actually recover the data? Do we have like some um, other job that is there to make sure that if someone fails, you get a recovery? Is it, do you have like in the in your infrastructure, do you have the port in Kubernetes having replicas and so on? These kind of things will help you solve problems in advance. And you need to be really clear and transparent with the stakeholders um, with any change that might happen. Because changes happen. It, it's a big and complex project. It's going to take at least three months. So, you know, a lot of things can change, but make sure you communicate that. Um, 
also, it's so important to foster innovation and creativity. As I said, um, data scientists tend, we tend to get bored quite easily, especially if it's a repetitive work. So sometimes you can choose what project to do, sometimes you cannot, right? Um, but you can provide space and resources for the team to pursue new ideas. Maybe they simply need one week to try out something or just one day a month or just a few hours, I don't know, whatever works, but something that they can innovate. Um, and also you need to celebrate successes and failures alike. Um, invest on ongoing education and professional development so they can stay up to date Things are changing so fast. Every single week, I'm lost already on how many LLMs have just seen the, the light in the past, I don't know, two days. Um, give them time to actually stay up to date with these trends. Be proactive into exposing the team to these trends. Maybe they simply need to have a call with Google so they can see Bart, or maybe they are willing to try out Code Whisperer for AWS. I don't know, whatever it is but make sure that you give them room to do so. Um, and also encourage team members to attend uh, conferences, workshops, meetups, whatever event. In the past, I have been even asked to take holidays to attend to a conference. That shouldn't happen. Being in a conference is an investment of your time and you are learning something out of it. And if you are actually speaking at a conference, that means that it's free marketing for the company. So encourage your team members to actually do that, to participate, to be active in the community. Not because you are getting like free marketing advice from your team members on, on the communities, but also you get exposure. They get exposure, they feel valued. That's why it's so important. So to summarize a little bit, Make sure that whatever project you're having, you're having an impact. So you need to have a deep understanding of the field um, to have the ability to translate technical concepts <laughs> to business value. So you need to make an impact. That's the most important thing and to actually get a successful data science team. And I know um, not all of us are technical enough to actually go into the code and sit down with some of your team members and start peer coding together. Um, but it's important that they, they feel like they can talk to you about anything and you are the reference for them. Culture. Um, as we said, there's like a million different offers on LinkedIn these days. You need to foster a culture where people feel proud of being part of that team. They, they, they need to feel valued. Um, so create a diverse team that has complementary skills and make sure that you're fostering this culture of collaboration and open communication. And you need to invest in growth. I know a lot of companies don't do that, but we need to invest in the growth of our team members. You have to have a commitment with them to ensure their educational and professional development, whatever the cost. And I think that's it. So if you've got any questions, I'll be very happy to answer them. <laughs>